Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome. I'm Fred Wary. I'm a senior fellow at the Middle East Program here at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this panel on Yemen's catastrophe, what can be done to stop the war. Uh, those of you who follow Yemen uh, may have attended an event that we held uh, roughly one year ago entitled The Yemen War, Is There an End in Sight? Of course, the answer to that question has been a tragic no. The conflict in the Arab world's poorest country has entered its third year and shows no sign of abating. The suffering inflicted by this war has become even more catastrophic, uh, with the United Nations calling it uh, the world's worst humanitarian crisis. And the, hu uh, the horrific details of, of that war, I think, are well known to all of us. Meanwhile, the local and regional complexities of the conflict, I think, have multiplied, uh, further confounding a resolution, um, whether it's the spread of AQAP, the fracturing of the Saleh uh, Houthi alliance, uh, the Emirati-Saudi uh, rift with Qatar, which is reverberating across the region. And our panel today will take stock of these emerging uh, developments among local and regional players um, with a view toward understanding what can be done to end the conflict, restore governance, services, and relief. Uh, it's a tall order. Uh, but because the U.S. itself is party to the conflict as well, um, we want to consider the impact of U.S. Uh, policies. And when our last panel convened, this was before the presidential elections. So I've asked our panelists to assess what has or has not changed under the new administration toward, toward Yemen. Uh, I'm delighted to briefly introduce our, our panelists. Uh, they know, need no introduction to most of you. Uh, Farah al-Muslimi is a non-resident fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, the Middle East program, with a wealth of insight uh, and firsthand expertise uh, into the country of his birth. He's just returned from a trip uh, to Yemen and if you've not seen it, I would recommend the video interview of that visit on Car Carnegie's Diwan uh, blog site. Also joining us is Nadwal Dasuri, another top analyst from Yemen with particular expertise uh, in the country's tribes and civil society. Uh, a non-resident senior fellow at the project Our Middle East Democracy. She's written a lot on the spread of AQAP uh, and also local and regional peace initiatives. Finally. I'm delighted to welcome Ambassador Gerald Feierstein, currently the Director for Gulf Affairs and Government Relations at the Middle East Institute, who of course served as the U.S. Ambassador to Yemen during a really pivotal time, 2010 to 2013, and then was closely involved in the country as the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near Eastern uh, Affairs. I think we've worked out a pretty good division of labor among our speakers. We've worked out a good order, I think, too. Uh, focusing first on regional developments, uh, sort of an on-the-ground perspective on Yemen, then the role of tribes and AQAP, and finally shifting back to uh, the impact of the international community, the regional actors, and the U.S. I've asked each of our speakers to speak for 10 minutes uh, to be both analytical but prescriptive, certainly not an easy task. Uh, Farah, we'll start out with, with you um, with some perhaps some insights from your, your recent Trip, I was struck by something you said um, in our last panel that short wars uh, change regimes, long wars change societies. And so what's happening you know, on the ground uh, based on, on your visit? Sure. Uh, good morning, and thank you very much. And thanks, everyone, for coming. It's good to have a stop by at Carnegie almost a year now we do it, uh, last time with Ambassador Budin. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I'm happy to share some thoughts from my trip into Yemen. but. Uh, I must warn you, if you're looking for something smart or optimistic, you might have to wait to the next two speakers. I actually was not was intern a long time ago, and uh, I never had the chance to look at satellite image. So my, my, my knowledge of Yemen is very, is very limited compared to the two speakers around. Um, and so is there an end in, in, in what can be done? A lot, I think. Um, but uh, is, is, you know, am I optimistic? Of course, no. Uh, Yemen, I traveled around, and uh, this was no more the country I know, uh, or this was no more the country I grew up. And this is the th one thing different in Yemen right now, is this is a massive scale war that we have never seen in our lives. Um, we have had always some sort of conflict, some sort of violence, some sort of something, but never this wide scale or never this huge. Um, that's because, yes, when there is some areas where there is no war, but there is a more of an economic destruction um, that had left most harm, specifically on the, on the north, more than the war itself. 
um, specifically the case of the no salaries for nine months, specifically the economic, seat, uh, uh, the economic seat internally and externally, has left more or less a shattered country. Um, a country where there is no money you can make or there is no job you can make except if you are in a front lines fighting, as that's right now the last big job in Yemen. Speaking on, on, on more details, there are right now at least uh, three Yemens uh, uh, emerging in Yemen right now. There is uh, one in Sana'a, uh, that's the Houthi Saleh, under the control of the Houthi Saleh. Um, and they basically have their own customs, their own borders, their own military, their own system. Um, and that's one part of the country. Um, and then there is second <coughs> Yemen, or a second uh, uh, station of power or center of power. And that's Aden. Um, and it's not really under anyone's control. Um, theoretically, it's under the control of the uh, legitimate government, but it, it has a long dispute between the southern Iraq, the president forces, and some different uh, fractions of, of armed groups that developed uh, uh, after the war. And the third station in, in Yemen, or the third Yemen that's right now there emerging, is in Marib, um, which is basically a combination of Islamists, a combination of the National Army, and a combination of basically every northerner who's not with the Houthis uh, is basically there. Marib in a lot of ways right now is the last geography that represents the Republic of Yemen, where you can be there despite where you are from um, around the country. That being said, um, these three stations of powers barely talk to each other anymore or barely uh, uh, have some sort of something combined in them. Uh, specifically since the removal of the Central Bank, which was a, an unthoughtful decision that ended up cutting the last uh, line that really keeping this place um, together. The important, I think, from um, the U.S. point of view, there is a lot can be done in that sense. Um, and that's basically because the U.S. is a direct uh, uh, active in this war, or a direct uh, actor in this war. But beyond that, um, the U.S. have something that no one else can do or can change. And I think that's a seat at the U.N. Security Council that would allow its ability to do a new resolution um, that basically would commit to peace in Yemen. 2216 may be made sense by that time, but it's a resolution that commits into uh, war. That's not a resolution that commits into peace. That, that would be one thing that the United States is going to start doing. Let alone that the legacy of an accountability that has a thrift in Yemen, and the US has been part of it. We hear a lot of complaints um, very legitly against the funeral bombings, the weddings bombings in Yemen, uh, which has been a common phenomenon. But as a matter of fact, this is a legacy the Saudis are only reading from America's playbook. Um, in the past, the United States have bombed funerals in Yemen. In the past, the United States have bombed weddings in Yemen. And the Saudis came after them. And actually, in fact, even Al-Qaeda has bombed weddings in Yemen in the past and funerals. So that legacy of unaccountability, that legacy of destruction can be stopped. And that's something, I think, that, that we can do from, um, from Washington, D.C. Um, in, in, in the way it, it, it goes. Now, um, depending on which side you take in Yemen, if you are a, a Houthi, you will say the war started in March 25th, uh, 2015. If you are someone with the other side, you will say the war started in September 21st. Um, but I think if you're someone with a brain, you would have a different timeline. Um, that will go back along to 2011, where we had something very problematic led to this war in Yemen, and that was uh, uh, the unconditional immunity that was brought by the international community and that was brought by the Gulf in, in, in Yemen. This was a dangerous act because it set the ground for doing whatever you want. Uh, and it set the ground for unaccountability in a country like Yemen was something where everyone has a gun and that's a very dangerous trend to start in the country. By that time, however, um, the Gulf was part of the solution in Yemen. Right now it's part of the problem. And that is a very, uh, probably the most unfortunate thing happening right now between Yemen and the Gulf. Um, in 2011, and probably Ambassador Palestine can speak more about this, but the Gulf was an honorary sponsor of the GCC deal. And it was able to have that ownership um, because it wasn't part of the problem. Right now, it's a big part of the problem. And that, that, that's what you lose when you decide to go into a war. You decide to become part of the problem, even if you didn't have to. And that's the big thing we're really losing. And I will end with this thought right now beyond the three centers in Yemen, beyond the regional dynamics, beyond the regional fights happening in Yemen, there is a moment of a fracture. Everything is being fractured, specifically two years after the war. This honeymoon is over. Um, it's over first between the Gulf themselves, who were in Yemen for completely different reasons, 
We have seen this very clear so far on the Qatar crisis with the Gulf uh, sidelining one country. But we will see soon also between uh, Saudi and UAE. It's a matter of time. Um, they will also ultimately uh, have to struggle for, and they are already, though not officially, have to struggle for some space. And we see it also within the Yemeni sides. So the, the, the honeymoon between the president and the Southern movement is over. Um, between the Islamists and their allies is over. And most recently between Saleh and the Houthis is over. And that's the, most, the, 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 the last dynamic uh, happening right now in the ground. So it's a moment of a fracture, a moment of a fragmentation, and a moment where everyone is part of the problem, unfortunately, whether let it be the Gulf or let it be uh, uh, the United States of America. And I'll, I'll come back if you want later on to, to any questions. Great. So Nedwa, if you could kind of take that view and, and drill down onto the role of tribes and, and AQAP. Uh, I'm going to second everything that Tara has said. I'm one of the big believers that if the GCC has not been signed in the first place, we wouldn't have ended in war. Um, so GCC was problematic. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to, to bring any less oblique picture of Yemen than you did, Tara. I'm, I'm also not very optimistic. Um, I'm going to talk about tribes and AQAP. And um, it's, it's such a complex topic. Um, I'm going to talk just about the dynamics of the relationships and how the relationship between tribes and AQAP and how, how it works, um, just to help you understand why tribes, uh, how tribes interact with the militant group and how they respond to threat um, in, in different ways. So, um, before I dig into the issue of tribes and AQAP, um, I, I want to, first of all, uh, highlight a few things about the tribes, um, just to help you understand how the tribes function. Um, the tribes are not solid units with command and control. Um, tribal leaders have some influence on tribes' men, on their tribes, but they cannot force their, their tribes or tribes' men to, to make certain choices. Um, Tribes are governed by customary law. Uh, their main means for resolving conflicts is negotiations rather than force. And the ultimate goal of customary law is to preserve social cohesion and achieve long-term reconciliation beyond violent conflicts. Um, tribes normally avoid the use of force um, unless they've exhausted every other mean for peacefully resolve a situation. They, they'll come to compromises to prevent their areas from becoming um, a zone for, for violent conflicts. And they will generally avoid fighting in their own areas unless they're faced with immediate threat. They, now, tribes have varying degrees of control um, in, in Yemen. Um, but they're, they're increasingly challenged by the political turmoil and uh, the um, deterioration of the security situation and the war. Now, the, the mainstream assumption about the tribes is that they offer um, a safe haven for AQAP. Uh, but evidence from research indicate that AQAP strength does not stem from the Yemeni tribes or, relation, or their relationship with, with the Yemeni tribes. AQAP spread in tribal areas for the same reasons that it spread in, in urban areas as well. Um, AQAP militants managed to, um, to, recruit, to recruit members among tribes, um, mainly by tapping into deep grievances and resentment against the central government. Um, and in particularly, they targeted youth who, are, um, who have no opportunity and limited education. But while AQAP recruited tribes men, and in some instances made their way into tribes through some tribal leaders, it was never able, the militant group was never able to recruit a tribe and was never successful, so far has failed to um, strike an alliance with any Yemeni tribe. I argue that the tribes have played a critical role in preventing AQAP from making substantial gains in Yemen. Without the tribes, I think, um, based on my research and other people as well, I think AQAP would have been much greater threat to Yemen um, and to the West. Without the tribes, AQAP would have been a much greater threat to the West and, and, and to Yemen. Um, tribes have pushed AQAP from Abiyan in 2012. They pushed AQAP from, uh, from Baida, from Rada, just 90 miles south of Sana'a in 2012. Um, and even under the current war, um, AQAP left major cities in, in South Yemen last year, 
um, not because of military offensive, but mainly because of, uh, as a result of tribal mediation, as a result of pressure from tribes. An AQAP was able to establish control and govern in areas that are, that are um, of, uh, of a, a, um, a weaker tribal structure. So the dynamics of the relationship, uh, tribes are stronger than AQAP, and AQAP is not strong to challenge the tribes yet. Um, AQAP has always been careful not to challenge the tribes um, and to avoid confronting, and, and has been keen to avoid confronting with them. <coughs> the group believes that the biggest threat to them, not the US military, not the Yemeni military, but the Yemeni tribes, because they know if the tribes turn against them, they cannot stand a chance. Now, the tribes see AQAP as a threat, but they never use the force against them. That's because the tribes fear that the use of force might um, might instigate violence within the tribes, mainly between members and of, of, of uh, tribes who are opposed to AQAP and others who are um, supportive. And there were clashes in the past that um, happened after interventions, peaceful or by using force to push AQAP out, um, that led to violence within the tribes. So um, the tribes try to avoid that because it's, it's it's it destabilizes the order within the tribes. Um, they've also, the tribes have never uh, gotten enough support or commitment from the government to, to fight AQAP, and they, they never were able to do it on their own. So the tribes have always implemented a strategy of containment, containment rather than direct confrontation with, it, with, with AQAP. Um, how much? How many minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes. <laughs> okay, I'll wrap up. Okay. So that, so that was all before the war. It's still the case. but. The, in this current war, the, the AQAP has gained a lot more presence among the tribes, um, particularly in areas where there is fighting between the Houthis and local tribes such as Baida. Um, the tribes who have previously been opposed to AQAP welcome the help of the AQAP to help them push out of their areas. Um, a classic example of the enemy of my enemy rather than sympathy with, 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 um, with AQAP. Um, so, but the tribes still see AQAP as a threat, but they see Houthis as a larger threat to them, as, as a more pressing, greater threat to them. Um, tribes perceive Houthis as, an, as outside aggressors um, and an extension of the imamate. Um, which is a, theo a theocracy that ruled Yemen and exploited tribes in mid and lower Yemen, which is, which is where the uh, AQAP is spread, um, until, until, 2000, until 1962. Now, Houthis have humiliated the tribes. Um, they have committed atrocities against them. They abducted, arbitrarily arrested, killed, and blew up the houses of their opponents, including tribal leaders. Um, by contrast, AQAP never, uh, never challenged the authority of the tribes and even protected them when they needed. Um, for the tribes, AQAP is tomorrow's problem, but Houthis are today's, today's uh, existential th threat that they need to deal with right now. Um, so the longer the fighting between Houthis and local tribe, tribes last, the more influence AQAP will have. And the longer the war continues, the weaker the tribes will be. And it's only a matter of time before the last line of defense against AQAP that has been effective so far, which is the Yemeni tribes, breaks down. Thank you. Okay, you thank you. Pick it up. And <laughs> I'll, I'll give all the answers. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, uh, thanks to, to you, Fred, and, and to the Carnegie Endowment for uh, giving us this opportunity to, to talk to you today. And thanks to the audience for, for coming. I wanted to to cover four elements of international community engagement in the Yemen conflict. Uh, one, uh, support for a resolution to the Yemen civil, uh, civil war. Uh, two, uh, the urgent efforts to address critical humanitarian requirements. Uh, third is the role of the Saudi-led coalition in supporting an end to the conflict, but also in the post-conflict period, which I think is extremely important. Uh, and finally, uh, to suggest an approach to addressing the resurgence of AQAP and violent extremism, uh, as, as Nedwa covered. Uh, I wanted to begin the discussion on, on the political situation uh, with a word about the GCC initiative and the implementing mechanism. 
uh, uh, many observers have argued, and uh, uh, Faria, I think, uh, would, would agree, that the GCC initiative was flawed uh, and uh, that a new political process should be launched that would expand participation uh, both demographically and uh, regionally, uh, therefore uh, potentially making, uh, uh, bringing about an outcome uh, that's uh, more reflective of, of broader Yemeni uh, preferences. Uh, in my view, many of the criticisms of the GCC initiative fail to acknowledge uh, that the negotiators of the initiative did attempt uh, to address uh, all or many of these shortcomings. Uh, they did require expanded participation by women and youth uh, uh, in the political process and even beyond the political process in all of the structures and all of the mechanisms of uh, the state. Uh, they insisted that there be uh, adequate representation uh, from the south and the north of the north, uh, and they established a national dialogue process uh, with the intent of addressing core challenges to Yemen uh, that went beyond the immediate political crisis. Uh, I, I wouldn't argue, I wouldn't suggest uh, that the GCC initiative was flawless, uh, but I would say that based on my own experience as one of the people uh, working on, on that process, that in my view it was the best solution that was attainable within uh, the context of the Yemeni reality at the time. Uh, I, I therefore think that it would be extremely optimistic uh, to suggest that a new effort uh, to start from scratch and negotiate a new agreement <clears throat> on a political arrangement in Yemen uh, would bring about a different or substantially better result. In fact, in my view, uh, uh, given the deepened fractures in Yemeni society as a result of the civil conflict, uh, I think it would be extremely unlikely uh, to uh, bring about any positive outcome, uh, let alone one that would improve on what we've already got. So the, the question is, what, to, <coughs> what does that mean uh, for the role of the international community? Uh, and in my view, I, I think that concluding the political transition process <coughs> under the terms of the GCC initiative and the outcomes of the National Dialogue Conference should remain uh, as the core objective for negotiating the resolution of the current civil conflict. Uh, in order to accomplish that, uh, the international community should support the UN effort that's underway under the leadership of uh, Special Envoy Ismail Ol Sheikh Ahmed uh, within the context of UNSCR 2216. Uh, the international community should continue to insist uh, that the legitimate government of Yemen be able to return to Sana'a and reestablish its functions, including maintaining law and order in the capital. Uh, but, but that also would permit uh, negotiations on governance issues uh, between the parties to continue once everyone is back in Sana'a. Uh, but in my view, any subsequent arrangement on changes to the governing structure uh, should be on the basis of mutual agreement and should be time limited uh, lasting only long enough to complete implementation of the GCC initiative and permit formation of a new government uh, chosen by the Yemeni people themselves. <laughs> and uh, I would point out in that regard uh, that the last time Yemenis have actually had the opportunity to go to the polls and choose their own government was in 2007. Uh, and people will argue whether that was a legitimate process either. You could maybe go all the way back to 2003. Uh, and therefore that elections uh, are long overdue. Uh, uh, secondly, addressing the humanitarian crisis should be, in my view, uh, as much of a priority, if not even a greater priority, for the international community uh, as is ending the, uh, the conflict. Uh, there is on the table a proposal to allow mutually accepted third parties uh, to assume control of the port of Hodeida and the Sana'a International Airport uh, opening them for humanitarian supplies, ensuring that they're not used for smuggling arms and other contraband into the country, uh, and managing onward distribution to communities regardless of their political affiliation. Uh, urgent repairs of the port of Hodeida <coughs> to restore its full capacity, uh, utilizing equipment which is already prepositioned in the region by the U.S. Uh, should be a part of any agreement to reopen the port. Uh, the Hadi government and the Saudi-led coalition have accepted this proposal. Uh, the Houthis have not. 
Uh, my understanding is that the Houthi reluctance to accept the proposal uh, relates to the loss of the enormous of financial windfall uh, that they gain through the control of Hodeida port. Uh, the international community should increase pressure on the Houthis to agree to this arrangement. Hodeida serves the 75% of the Yemeni population that lives in the north. Uh, and similarly, the continued closure of Sana'a airport has imposed extremely negative effects on thousands of Yemenis. Uh, if Iran were to want to play a positive role in addressing the needs of the Yemeni people, as opposed to sustaining the conflict, uh, this would be a golden opportunity for it to demonstrate goodwill by using its influence with the Houthis to press them uh, to cooperate on the proposal. Uh, in addition to reopening Hodeida and Sana'a port, uh, the international community should press both the government and the Houthi Sala alliance to restore the functioning of the central bank, and this goes back to Faria's point. A key element of the humanitarian crisis in Yemen is not related to the absence of food and other essential supplies in the country. In fact, they are available. It's the absence of the means to purchase available supplies. 25% uh, of Yemenis depend on government payments for their income. Uh, the inability or unwillingness to continue these payments has compounded the crisis. The international community should insist uh, that the parties cooperate in reestablishing the central bank ensuring that it can function outside of the political conflict uh, and continuing to explore measures like the establishment of a trust fund uh, that would guarantee that the central bank would have the resources that it requires in order to capitalize economic activity. Uh, the Yemeni conflict is primarily a civil war uh, and the decision to end the conflict is primarily in the hands of the Yemeni parties to the civil war. Uh, nevertheless, the Yemeni people and the international community uh, look to Saudi Arabia and its coalition partners uh, to provide assurance that they will support a reasonable political agreement to end the fighting. Based on my own experience discussing the conflict with senior Saudi officials, as well as the comments by Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman that have been recently made public, uh, I believe that Saudi Arabia would in fact welcome a conclusion to the conflict. Uh, undoubtedly, the Yemen conflict has uh, imposed costs on Saudi Arabia in human and financial terms as well as in damage to its international reputation uh, that were unanticipated at the beginning of the conflict. Uh, that said, I believe that Saudi Arabia will identify three core elements of an agreement that it can support. Uh, one, uh, the presence of a government in Sana'a that will maintain friendly relations with Riyadh. Uh, two, security for the Saudi-Yemeni border and an end to cross-border violations. And third, uh, no hostile Iranian presence in Yemen. Uh, in regard to the first requirement of a friendly government, uh, the Saudis have been clear that they are not opposed to Houthi participation in a future Yemeni government, uh, provided that uh, they function as a political organization and not as an armed militia uh, in the manner of Hezbollah. Uh, the goals and objectives of the second partner in the coalition, the UAE, are less well established. Uh, the Emiratis join the coalition primarily to demonstrate uh, support for Saudi Arabia and to underline uh, their perception that the threat of the Yemeni uh, conflict uh, presented a challenge broadly to Gulf security and stability. Uh, the Emirati leadership has been clear, both publicly and privately, uh, that they regret that the conflict has not been resolved yet and that they would welcome its end. Uh, nevertheless, the deterioration of the Emirati relationship with the Hadi government, uh, relations with southern secessionist elements in Aden, and rumored negotiations with members of the Ali Abdullah Saleh family about their potential future role in Yemeni governance uh, raise questions about the UAE's continued commitment uh, to abide by the terms of UNSCR 2216. It's important that the international community remain very clear in its discussions with members of the coalition and others uh, that uh, its commitment to the UN negotiations and an outcome that is consistent with the relevant agreements, the GCC initiative, the outcomes of the National Dialogue Conference and UNSCR 2216 is ironclad. It's also important that the uh, international community remain clear-eyed about the importance of achieving a resolution of the Yemen conflict that is reassuring to Yemen's Gulf neighbors. 
uh, Yemen's friends anticipate that Saudi Arabia and its Gulf partners will take the lead in guiding and financing essential reconstruction and development efforts in Yemen in the post-conflict period. Uh, welcoming Yemen into broader economic and uh, social integration with its Gulf neighbors uh, is potentially an important element of Yemen's future economic, political, and social stability. It's unrealistic to expect that the Saudis and their partners would take on their anticipated role in a scenario where they perceive that the outcome of the conflict uh, left their security and national interests under threat. Uh, finally, a word on the equally important issue of the effort to defeat al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, AQAP, and other extremist groups. Uh, in a welcome development, the UAE in particular has committed to confront terrorist groups, uh, successfully pushing AQAP out of Makalla, and now expanding the fight to Shabwa. Uh, the U.S. has supported that effort and has also resumed its own engagement to turn back AQAP's efforts to capitalize on the political conflict in the country and regain ground it lost during the period of 2011 to 2014 uh, that featured cooperation and coordination between the United States and the government of Yemen. But in pursuing the fight against AQAP, it's absolutely essential that care be taken to distinguish uh, between those elements truly committed to AQAP's ideological embrace of global jihad and those Yemenis who might have turned to AQ not out of any ideological commitment, uh, but because they believed they were engaged in an existential fight uh, with domestic opponents and saw AQAP as a source of needed arms and finance. I agree entirely with Nedwa on this point. Frankly speaking, I think for many uh, Yemenis, uh, Yemeni uh, uh, tribes, uh, they don't see AQ any differently than they see the government of Yemen or in fact any differently than they see the United States uh, as, uh, as uh, some uh, entity that they can use to their own advantage and their own requirements. Uh, once the fighting has ended and the time has come to renew the focus on the fight against extremism, we will need to rebuild relations with the latter group uh, and regain their support uh, in the effort to eliminate AQ. Uh, if we fail to distinguish between these two groups, uh, we run the risk of losing access to potential allies in the future, uh, making the fight against AQAP infinitely more difficult, if not impossible. And I'll stop there. Wonderful. Well, thank you all for the uh, comprehensive but concise uh, presentations. We stayed well within the limit, which, which gives a lot of time for questions. I'm going to take the first round, just a few um, follow-ups. Uh, Farah, you, you on your trip, I think you also went to Muscat. Um, can you say a bit about Oman's uh, role in this and, and what you felt on the ground from Oman's uh, efforts? Yeah, I mean, uh, Oman is one of the, go the only Gulf country that wasn't part of the coalition. Um, it has tried to disattach itself from the, the military operations in Yemen. And it does uh, have a quite, uh, because of that, it does have a quite a leverage over the Houthis. Uh, that, to my understanding, is even higher than actually the leverage of the Iranians and actually is higher than the leverage of any other actor among the Houthis uh, because they, uh, one, again, again, have not been bombing them, but two, have played this side track um, of brokers between them and the rest of the Gulf countries, uh, sometimes even organize the secret negotiations, sometimes organize the meeting between the Americans and the Houthis. The Omanis enjoy very much the backseat um, usually, they don't like media. Uh, they don't talk to the media. They have a quite rooms for negotiations that goes back uh, from the Iranian deal to the current one. Um, and they have uh, tried uh, to, again, keep themselves away from this larger regional fragmentation, whether on Yemen or in Syria or in, in different other uh, crises over the region. Uh, it does not have hostile relationship with the Saudis. It can have a hostile relationship with the UAE. Um, it has a different agenda with UAE than it has with Saudi, or more different. Um, uh, right now, it has also a new ally inside the Gulf, uh, which is Kuwait. Um, uh, you know, but Kuwait is assigned to solve the Qatar crisis, not the Yemeni crisis. Um, one one main thing is the Oman have not used. Um, they have used their leverage over the Houthis to solve a problem between the Houthis and outsiders. 
they still haven't uh, used it or used that leverage to mediate between the Houthis and other Yemenis, which is really Houthis' main problem. Main problem is not with the Saudis or with the international. Their very main problem they are facing right now is with Yemenis, um, and that's the biggest obstacle they are they are they are going to face in the, in the long term. Um, specifically because MBS and Abdul Malik Al Houthi war is not because they are that much different, but rather because they couldn't be best friends yet. Um, there is a lot of similarities that exist in that end, more than any differences um, between the two or as cities or as powers or as, as, as even their perception of life and politics overall in Yemen. Yeah. Great. And Nadwa, you gave us a really uh, granular I mean, view of, of the tribes and their, their relationships. Can you just sort of you know, operationalize this? I mean, this, this, you know, how, do, how do tribes interact with outside actors and how do outside actors try to influence tribes. I mean, there's this sort of policy mystique about tribes that they can be mobilized from the outside. And how, you know, how does that work in I practice? Mean, and so uh, you know, from, from both I mean, the regional, but also maybe US yeah. perspective. Well, the tribes are not isolated entities course, in Yemen and outside right. Yemen. Tribal leaders and tribal members have been members of tribes, members of government, I mean, members of Saleh government. And his opposition leaders were, were tribal leaders. Um, they, the tribes were engaged in the National Dialogue Conference. Um, they, a lot of tribesmen are in Saudi um, right now. So they're there, they're engaged in the process, but they haven't been, uh, the, tribes ha the, the tribes have not been engaged previously by the Yemeni government um, in Saleh and in Hadi in the war against the AQAP. Um, the, the, Honestly, because I think Saleh and Hadi were not really committed to fight, committed, uh, they did not have a commitment to fight AQAP. And in fact, Saleh exploited AQAP for his own, used AQAP for his own purposes um, to eliminate his op opponents and to keep money coming from, uh, from the West. So I, I think uh, the tribes remain the untapped potential. They're accessible, uh, they like to talk. Uh, they like to compromise, <coughs> and um, and they know better than anybody else in their own local context what is what is best that can be done, not only to fight AQAP and 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 undermine the group, but also to establish security and governance in their in their own areas. And I think they need to be engaged at a local level, um, case by case. And you talked about the UAE efforts in in Shabwa and and Hamramaut and. I think the problem with the with the UAE effort, although I think there might be good intentions, I think the problem is that they have excluded certain tribes. For example, in Shabwa, the Shabwa elite forces that are managed by the Emiratis, they raided tribes. They're formed of certain tribes. Um, they ex they excluded Al Awalik tribe, which is the largest in Shabwa and is the tribe where AQAP is active. Um, so I think. Even though these efforts are welcome in principle, I think they haven't been sensitive to the tribal context, and they have been more based on a traditional security approach rather than you know engaging the tribes and engaging the community, which is what we need to do. Ambassador, um, in in your presentation, you you mentioned the the I word, which gets a lot of uh, currency around here. Iran, the role of Iran. Mm -hmm. um, how do you think about? Iran's role. Can you say a bit more? You said if they choose not to sustain the conflict anymore, but they can play a role in, in brokering peace by pressing the Houthis. I mean, what's, what's your conception of Iran's centrality to this, their, their actual influence on the ground, if you could say? Well, uh, uh, th there's no question, I, I think, that uh, Iran has been involved in the um, Yemeni conflict in an extremely negative way. Uh, that Iran has exploited uh, the situation inside of Iran uh, in order uh, basically to threaten um, primarily Saudi, but more broadly Gulf security and stability, uh, and that that was, uh, you know, uh, done provocatively and, and, and basically resulted, I mean, that was a key component of the Saudi decision to intervene in in uh, the Yemen conflict in, in March of 2015. And so, so the, the, um, the Iranian role, which actually goes all the way back, and one of the, one of the things that I, I think is important to keep in mind is that Iran began uh, its efforts to, um, uh, to uh, uh, provide military training and assistance to the Houthis at least um, in 2012, if not 
prior to 2012. So, so at a period in which, in fact, there was um, a broad movement within Yemen to try to achieve a peaceful political transition, the Iranians were already smuggling weapons to, um, uh, to the Houthis. They were already uh, uh, sending IRGC and Hezbollah trainers to uh, Saada. So their role, which primarily has been directed by the IRGC and the Quds Force, up until this point has been a negative one. The question is whether um, uh, there is within Iran a sense that um, a, if they wanted to reduce tensions in the region, um, uh, and B, if the Rouhani government were ready to challenge uh, the IRGC and the Iran hardliners, that you could make the argument that one place that they could uh, um, achieve quick success would be in Yemen. Yemen is not important for Iran. It never has been important for Iran. It is important for Saudi Arabia. Uh, and therefore, if they wanted to uh, do something to reach out to the Saudis, that would be a good place for them to do it. Uh, and that, I think, is, is an idea that we, not, maybe not necessarily the United States, but that others, uh, the UN or others, might um, explore. And if, if I may, on that yeah, point, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's, yeah, it's important to realize that probably Iran's rule in Yemen is destructive, like anywhere uh, else in the region. but. There is a three myths that usually goes with, with, with talk, when talking about Iran and Yemen. Uh, first, the Iranians, just like everyone else, they were surprised by the takeover of the Sana'a by the Houthis. It was a surprise to them. It was a surprise. And the Houthis would have taken Sana'a with Iran and without Iran help. And in fact, what happened also uh, in addition to that is they took, uh, there was even a Gulf OK for the Houthis to take over Sana'a by that time, two years ago. And there was too many local dynamics and too many Gulf internal crisis that they actually were happy with the Houthis when it comes to taking this uh, down. I don't, you know, I, 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 I think even by now the Houthis realize that their, import, their relationship with Saudi is more important than relationship with Iran. And again, they are fighting not because they are uh, uh, the Hezbollah in Yemen, but rather, in my opinion, because um, they are looking for attention from within the Saudis. Um, I, I, you know, probably the Iranians give some sort of building capacity to the Houthis, but you will never really need to teach Yemenis how to fight, let alone the Houthis, a group that has emerged on fight um, since, since 2004. And uh, uh, finally, I mean, the Houthis, even right now, to my knowledge, uh, uh, make more money on a black market and buy weapons from the government outside more than they actually get from Iran. Um, Iran has looked at them as a very little, low cost um, a problem they can raise in Saudi's face more than really as a strategic ally. Interestingly, the U Iran has dealt with Yemen exactly the same way the U.S. has dealt with Yemen. Uh, the U.S. has offshored Yemen to Saudi, and the Iranians have offshored Yemen to Hezbollah. Uh, it's almost their, con their biggest contractor in Yemen is Hezbollah. They don't even deal with it directly, just exactly like the U.S. and Yemen in, and, and going through Saudi. Yeah, I good. wouldn't agree so with all of that, but uh, <laughs> uh, anyway. That's I'm not saying that's Saudi that's is like point. Hezbollah, but you know. <laughs> so we are going to have lots of questions. So we'll take questions three at a time. Please introduce yourself, identify yourself, and please do ask a question. So we'll start with you, sir. <coughs> Well, wait, wait for the mic if you wouldn't mind, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, we didn't. Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mohammed Al Hadrami. I'm uh, the political counselor at the Yemen Embassy here in DC. Uh, thank you very much for organizing this, and I thank the, the panelists for a very informative and lucid uh, presentations. I have actually two questions uh, with some comments in between. As you know, Yemen, uh, it's, uh, it's not only affected by its surroundings, it's also affected by its internal dynamics, like any other conflict. And for Fada, that leads me to the question, having been lucky enough to be in Sana'a recently, the most talk topic in Sana'a now is the friction between Saab and the Houthis. 
I want to hear your insights and also what are the perspectives of the residents of Sana'a of this conflict? Do you think it's the beginning at the end of this fragile conflict and how, in your opinion, it would affect the future peace talks? And for ambassadors, it's always uh, good to see you and to hear your thoughts. You mentioned Hudayda plan, which, as you know, it averted uh, a military option that the government was seeking to liberate Hudayda and to get all the profiteering from aid and all the abuses. The government agreed. The Houthis refused. You mentioned pressures in your presentation. So what kind of pressures do you think? How can the government, the international community, do to help Will the Sheikh persuade the Houthis to come back to the round, uh, another round peace talks? Because without this, I don't think we could get it over. Um, and thank you very much. Hi, my name is Kate Kaiser. I'm with the Yemen Peace Project. Um, my question is for Farah and Nadwa. Um, I wonder if you could speak to the issue of accountability. Um, over the last, since 2011, really, there has not been an internationally led investigation to abuses by all sides, um, and abuses by all sides continue with impunity um, in the conflict. And I wonder what role the international community can take um, and maybe use that as leverage to push for peace. Very important question. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my name is Jonathan Apiki. I'm with uh, Partners Global. Um, thank you all for your very insightful remarks. Um, I just had a quick question in particular for the Yemeni panelists, uh, Nadwan Farah. Um, as, we, as we, most of us know, Yemen has a very rich tradition of conflict resolution and mediation um, historically. Um, and in many ways, if this war was up to Yemenis themselves to resolve, it probably would have been resolved. Um, but it's not, there's so many outside actors. Um, and we know, and we have seen a lot of traction at the local level, especially locally, local tribes, um, making progress and traction um, in the peace process at the local level, where we, whether we talk about prisoner swaps, you know, last year in Taiz, there was a very large prisoner swap that was mediated by local tribes, um, whereas Ben Omar took months and months and only released four prisoners. Um, so I'm, I'm, my question is, what can the international community do to harness the power of local mediation that exists in Yemen, to harness the historical traditions, whether it's customary law or otherwise, that exist in Yemen of conflict resolution? Because I think that's very much lacking. Mm -hmm. And if there was an opportunity to grasp and build on that, we would make much more progress in the uh, peace process. Thank you. Why don't we start with that last question, maybe, on the local local resolution, maybe if you guys want to take that. Yeah. Um, so I, I mean, you're right that the tribes, even under the current war, even in areas where they're fighting, they still continue to carry conflict resolution. Uh, there were um, a few <coughs> very complex tribal conflicts that have been solved this year um, in Baida and in Ma'arib um, that have been around for quite, one is 40 years and the other one is 20 years between tribes, but they were resolved in the current war, during the current war. Uh, the tribes have taken measures in order to avoid, in order to, to mitigate the impact of the conflicts and the fightings um, on the dynamics between the tribes themselves. Um, as you said, they have, uh, they have helped, um, you know, in, in, in diffusing some tensions and in prisoner swaps. I think the one thing that the international community need to do is stop being solely focused on the national process. Um, it's important to, to focus on the peace process. It's important to, foc to focus on bringing the sides, the main sides of the conflict into, into an agreement, although I doubt that that would happen because I don't see these sides committed to, to peace more than the war because they benefit from the war. Um, than, than peace. I think what should be done is, is take a localized approach, case by, by case. Da'ez is different than Ma'rib, is different than Bayda, is different than Shabwa, is different than Abiyan. So from a, a, a peace perspective and from a security perspective, we need to take these case by case. We need to engage the tribes. Um, I talked about you know um, uh, undermining AKAP, but I think tribes need to be 
also engaged in terms of local reconciliation because this war, as Farah mentioned, it left, um, it, it affected the communities, it affected the society, it created conflicts at a very, very local level, which hasn't happened before in Yemen. And so the tribal mechanisms, the tribes can help mitigate tensions at that level so that we prevent you know, total collapse of the society. Um, and it's, it's true that Yemen has not collapsed so far because it has, it, has, has, it has had a strong society, but that's changing. And I think the tribes can mitigate that change and kind of slow down and in some cases reverse that kind of deterioration in, in the society. Question to both you on accountability. Yeah, I mean, and, and, uh, if, I, if I take a few minutes. Um, Look, I think the investigative committee is the most uh, uh, clear or the, more, the, the biggest evidence of how unserious the international community is about in Yemen, about peace, how not serious it is. This is important because, and this was the biggest flaw with the GCCB. I, mean, I don't have any better argument that, than today's better, than, than today's unfortunate reality to say that that was a problematic. I mean, it ultimately led to this war, or whether we like it or not. And I think that happened because of the absence of, an, of accountability. When you have someone like Saleh and you give him accountability, you give him immunity, and you make it very unconditional. Uh, you, you, you have someone who is the head of a mafia and the head of a state. And suddenly, he's just the head of the mafia. Uh, and since 2011, they have been blocking all investigative committees, internationally speaking. And that has been the best thing, not just to the Saudis, but even to the Houthis. Look to the siege on Taiz. They can do it. They can continue, because they are very sure that the government in Riyadh will actually block a creating investigative committee and the international community behind it. So that, that, that has been probably the most dangerous thing in Yemen and the region overall. No accountability since this war started or since 2011. And when you produce and when you introduce that legacy, you should not be surprised with violence that comes after it. And it's something that one thing the U.S. can start doing right now is basically stop blocking the creation of an international investigative committee in Geneva. It's extremely important and I think it can play a big role. On the Houthi Saleh relationship, just like on every side, honeymoon is over. Um, they basically had to be, you know, found themselves in the same side, and then second day they found that they have to answer bigger questions, they have to um, share things, they have to participate in a few things, and that's what sparked uh, a violence between them or a fight between them. This is uh, uh, specifically true right now in Sana'a. The Houthis have the money and they have security. Saleh has the politics and some of the weapons. This is the division of, of, of right now of resources among between them in the ground in Sana'a. Um, and on, on specifically on, on uh, uh, local mediation and on, on uh, tribes, yes, it can work. It can do something. But the problem right now is this is not anymore a war in the hand of Yemenis. It is about Yemen. It is in Yemen, but it is not in the hand of Yemenis. We can end the local thing, we can all the local facilitation, the tribal here and tribal there, but there has to be a larger regional and international agreement to end the war in Yemen. And it's possible, contrary to Libya, contrary to Syria, this is a solvable crisis. This is a fight that everyone can end specifically, but that decision has to happen. Uh, and, and there is so much limit to what you can do with, with local uh, uh, mediation if you basically end the crisis here and then everyone from outside, from both sides, keep arming weapons and money. There is a limit to what you can do with that. You can do a damage control, you can maintain the social cohesion to a certain point, but you cannot really achieve much. There has to be a decision that there needs to be peace in Yemen. That decision is not taken right now. The UN might can know it, but the UN is no more capable of solving this crisis. The UN needs absolute rebranding, either from its envoy or from its process or from the way it has done yeah, things in Yemen since 2011. It was not as sensitive to a locally driven, contextualized process. National Dialogue Conference was the most expensive uh, 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 and biggest networking event in the history of Yemen. Um, did it do much beyond that? Uh, no. It brought, brought some youth, brought some women, yes. It, they participated in the process, but they participated in a faulty process. There was an empowerment of youth, yes, but there were empowerment of youth to corruption, empowerment of youth to do what the elderly are doing. Same applies with women. That whole process needs to be rebranded, needs to be rethought uh, in, 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 from a local and international perspective. Master, the question on Hudeda, I think, on the press. Yeah, I'm, uh, but before I do that, I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to respond. And, and, and you know, fundamentally, as, as somebody who was very much involved in the whole effort to um, 
uh, to work out the GCC initiative. I think the thing that people need to keep in mind is that the Yemeni society was divided in 2011. This was not a uh, situation where, um, where uh, people could dictate to Ali Abdullah Saleh what the terms of the agreement were going to be. The fact of the matter is that, like it or not, there would not have been a GCC initiative without the agreement to provide Ali Abdullah Saleh immunity. Now, you can say that that was uh, you know, an unfortunate occurrence. I wouldn't necessarily disagree with you. I think that it, it would have been a good thing. I think it would have been a good thing if uh, we had been able to demand that Ali Abdullah Saleh leave Yemen and give up politics. But that simply wasn't in the cards. It was not realistic in 2011 to demand that. And so the issue that we, who were trying to promote and, and to arrive at an agreement on a peaceful transition, uh, were left with is that we could make accommodations and make compromises, as unhappy and as unwelcome as they may have been, uh, or we could have had Syria in 2011. And if you want to argue that Syria has an out a happier outcome than Yemen does, uh, we can have that conversation. But I think that that was the reality, and I think that you have to, to accept and understand that that was the reality that we, who were trying to work on these issues, were confronted with. Um, in, in terms of Iran, uh, what I would say is that uh, you know, Ismail has gone uh, to <coughs> Tehran uh, and tried to um, speak to them, uh, uh, to, to talk to, to Zarif and to see whether there is scope within the Iranian context to be more helpful, more constructive in trying to, uh, to approach this. I mean, you know, part of the problem that we have right now is that the international community all of the weight, all of the influence that the international community has is, is fundamentally on one side of the equation, uh, which is the government, the, uh, the coalition, uh, and therefore all of the emphasis, all of the focus is on the roles of the government and the coalition in all of this. There is no countervailing pressure on the Houthis or Ali Abdullah Saleh to, to be responsive. Uh, and so, you know, you, you ask whether uh, uh, Ismail can get people to come back to the negotiating table. Uh, that's a good question. And I think it would be extremely helpful if we could engage the Iranians in some way, not necessarily to demand or to force uh, a Houthi outcome uh, or, or Houthi cooperation, but at least to put their finger on the scales to tip it that way uh, and to make clear to the Houthis that they would welcome um, a, uh, uh, an outcome. I, I agree with Freya that, uh, that the Houthis are not um, a wholly owned subsidiary of the government of Iran or the IRGC or even Hezbollah, uh, but, uh, but I don't agree that, that the Iranians don't have at least the capacity to have substantial influence on the way the Houthis think. Uh, I also agree uh, with the fact, and I've always agreed and always had the conversations with uh, our friends in, in Saudi Arabia, that ultimately the Houthis are not stupid. They understand that they are always going to share a border with Saudi Arabia. They're never going to share a border with Iran. That eventually their interest lies in having a relationship with Saudi Arabia. And the fact of the matter is that if you go back 18 months and look at the spring of 2016, that's exactly what was happening. Well, the last time that I was in Riyadh was in April of that year. Uh, and in fact, uh, at that time, uh, there was a dialogue going on between the Houthis and, and the Saudis. Uh, there was uh, optimism. There was, in, uh, in, in effect, a, a de facto, if not de jure, ceasefire on the border. Uh, the Saudis were sending significant humanitarian assistance to Saada. Uh, there, um, uh, there, uh, uh, there was a prisoner exchange between the Saudis and the Houthis. Uh, and so things were moving uh, in a very positive direction, and, and I can say that the Saudi leadership was quite optimistic that, in fact, they had cracked the code on the Houthis. And so the question is what happened uh, between uh, the spring of 2016 and now, and why did the Houthis pull away from that and resume uh, the conflict with uh, Saudi Arabia in the effort to, to threaten Saudi? So, uh, I think that, that certainly Iranian and Hezbollah influence uh, uh, played a role. And the other, <clears throat> the other thing that, that I would say about the Houthis, uh, my own sense, is that you know, people kind of think about the Houthis in a monolithic sense. 
they think that you know all of the Houthis follow the leadership of Abdul Malik al Houthi. Uh, I think that they follow the leadership <coughs> of, of Abdul Malik al Houthi in the same way that the Iranians were all uh, followers of the Ayatollah Khomeini when he was still alive, which is that you have many different approaches. Everybody says yes, we're a follower of the Ayatollah, but they all follow him in their own ways. And I think that within the Houthi uh, within the Houthi uh, structure, uh, you have many different views, many different factions. I think that there is a peace faction w among the Houthis, uh, but I also think that there is a faction within the Houthis, particularly among elements who are in Sana'a, uh, that we encountered in a very negative way uh, in 2015, um, that, uh, um, that is committed to an extremely aggressive approach to continuing the war, and I think that those are the elements that are closest to the Iranians, closest to Hezbollah. I mean, I agree and disagree. I think it's the thing with the Houthis is they are very, you're right, they're very different group, and there is no one pack you can put them in it. But I think the problem is not with the Houthis of Sa'da, but rather with the Houthis of Sana'a. Mm -hmm. yeah? The one who will block mm -hmm. peace is actually the Houthis who from Sana'a, who live off devalizing Sa'da to the world and devalizing the world to Sa'da. Mm -hmm. Think of them as a, as a weapon uh, company in DC. Uh, they benefit off a lot of disputes, a lot of problems. And this is a very problematic group um, in, when within the Houthis who wants basically, who just like the war economy, except in a different way. There are so many people who are benefiting all the way from Riyadh to Sa'da and don't want to end this war, even when it is possible. And I think that's what really stood in front of many possible peace deals, is that war has established itself as an economy for everyone inside every group that it is now too expensive to too many people to end this war. Right, I agree with that completely. Uh, yes, Bill Hartung, Center for International Policy. Um, two things that haven't come up, the Saudi bombing campaign and the civilian <coughs> casualties, the allegations of torture by the UAE. Um, doesn't the US have to address that maybe condition military support on getting to the bottom of that. Um, can, can those things just be put to the side? Hi, Laura Kasadoff, a journalist who worked in Yemen. Um, I have a question for Ambassador Firestein. Um, I'm curious about what going forward and even talking about the GCC initiative going forward, um, the things that went wrong in the past, which I'm sure we all have some different ideas, some of the same ideas of the things that went wrong in the past, um, what is going to change going forward? And then particularly in regards to Sala, because that obviously was a big issue in the past, whether it be immunity and whether or not he would have agreed to step down, obviously, without the immunity, but what's going to be done with him in the future and his family, and particularly him. Um, and then also what's going to be done about Hadi's lack of legitimacy, I guess, and lack of popularity, particularly in Sana'a. Um, and then I have a question for Nadwa about tribalism. Um, and the, I mean, the, tribalism has sort of broken down in Yemen, or at least that's how it used to be seen throughout the years more and more as people were moving to the cities. And I'm curious if you think that this current conflict has changed that or that it has continued to break down. Um, or that if it has sort of strengthened the role of the tribe, I'm, I'm curious. And then I have a final question for Farah, since he was recently in Yemen and particularly in um, AQAP areas about, you know, occasionally in the media we see news about um, ISIS rising in Yemen or the ISIS fighting with AQAP in Yemen or something like that. And so I'm curious about your take on whether or not um, there can, whether or not there's ISIS in Yemen. <laughs> Thank you very much, Michael Kurtzig, retired from the Department of Agriculture. And I will admit at the outset, I'm quite ignorant about the subject of Yemen. And that's why I'm here to learn. And your comments yesterday were excellent and the whole conference was excellent. I'm looking from the economic side. And I don't want to insult Yemen. What is the attraction? Is there oil? Are there minerals there? Is there liquid natural gas it's sitting on an aqueduct of water the size of the Mediterranean or something? What, there's constant fighting there. And just to go back, it seems to me I remember 1975, 80, 80, Egypt was in there, and there's always somebody in there from outside. What do they want? Is it, or is it strictly a strategic battle 
between, uh, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Thank you. Go back to the question on the bombing campaign, torture, and conditionality on U.S. aid. If that's well, uh, of course, the uh, the Obama administration did uh, pull back uh, on uh, on a number of the different aspects of uh, of cooperation with Saudi Arabia from the time that the conflict began in March of 2015 until the end of the administration um, in 2000. Um, uh, my own view was that that was counterproductive. Uh, uh, I never agreed with it. I didn't agree with it when I was in the State Department. I didn't agree with it after I left the State Department um, uh, for a few reasons. Look, uh, in, in terms of the bombing campaign, and, and uh, uh, Faria made the, the point in a very uh, tendentious way, but, but not in a, in a particularly incorrect way, factually. Um, you know, uh, uh, you look at the U.S. Air Force uh, um, uh, record in Afghanistan, for example. You look at it in Syria or, or Iraq, um, uh, as well as, uh, unfortunately, uh, sometimes in Yemen. Um, have we hit uh, uh, funerals? Uh, yes. Have we hit wedding parties? Yes. Have we uh, caused civilian casualties? Yes. Did we do it on purpose? Did we do it um, out of recklessness? No. Uh, we did it because these things are uh, unfortunate, uh, uh, you know, aspects of, of a conflict, and, and unfortunately they happen. Uh, and I would say the same thing about Saudi Arabia. I mean, people uh, throw around this idea that war crimes have been committed. I don't believe that war crimes have been committed. I think that there have been uh, unfortunate incidents. The funeral party uh, incident uh, uh, last year uh, being the most dramatic. Uh, aspect of that, but there are other things. I think always the importance in this is to is to investigate, to understand uh, what happened, what went wrong. Sometimes the funeral party uh, incident, I think uh, that uh, uh, the government of Saudi Arabia did do an investigation, and I think that they came back with a report and said that this was a result of bad intelligence, that they were uh, uh, misguided or misunderstood what the nature of this gathering was, and therefore they uh, they thought that they were hitting a, uh, a Houthi uh, group. So um, you know, I, I think that it's important. And, and where we were engaged earlier on in the conflict was trying to work with the Saudis in trying to help improve all of those aspects of of their performance. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you minimize uh, the number of, of uh, these kinds of incidents? And, and I would say that if you look at the, the, the trend line, um, you know, there is a, a decline in the number of these things over these uh, past years. So, so I think that more engagement rather than less engagement is the key to all of this. Uh, and uh, and always recommended that we were also working very carefully and closely with the Saudis on um, uh, doing more to ensure that everybody who was involved in these operations understood uh, what the laws of armed conflict were, uh, what the various international responsibilities were if you were doing these things, so that in fact you could make sure that people um, uh, were were observing. Uh, all of the relevant international law, and I think that that's the right way to go forward. Uh, on the issue of uh, allegations of Emirati torture in McCullough, I think it's an important issue. I think that there needs to be a full investigation. Uh, I think that uh, all of the uh, parties involved have denied it, uh, but, I, but I think that, that there needs to be a better understanding of what exactly happened, what, whether there was uh, truth or not. So, um, yeah. Why don't we follow up with the question to you? Yeah, I, I, my my own my own sense. I, I think that the that the fundamental elements of the initiative were good. Um, the uh, the uh, implementation of the initiative was mixed. Um, we, you know, uh, after after the agreement was completed, the international community. Um, the, the 10 embassies that were directly involved in, in this uh, kind of divided up responsibilities of, of tracking the implementation of various components. 
and uh, uh, the U.S. Embassy took uh, responsibility for the uh, military and security reorganization aspect. And I would say that, uh, you know, as is obvious from what happened, uh, our success was not, uh, was not spectacular. Uh, and it wasn't spectacular pri pri primarily because um, the, the Salas continued uh, to uh, interfere and continue to uh, try to ensure that, uh, that leadership of the military remained loyal to them as opposed to loyalty to the state and that the government never felt strong enough to uh, really change that, not the uh, Minister of Defense, not the President, uh, despite the fact that we had many conversations about the need to replace the leadership of the, of the military. And so, um, and, and so you had that. I would say that the National Dialogue Conference was, was generally a success. Uh, I think that, I think that uh, in fact, uh, the, uh, the final um, uh, uh, communique of the National Dialogue, the, the, the decisions that the National Dialogue reached uh, were legitimate. And uh, it, was, it was very difficult, of course, holding everybody together. It was very difficult getting the Southerners to commit. And the South is so deeply fractured uh, that there was really no group, no, no, certainly no individual who could speak authoritatively for what the South wanted. Uh, and and uh, so you know you had a lot of a lot of those kinds of problems, but fundamentally, I, I think that the outcome wasn't bad, uh, and that many of the elements I believe uh, will be part of the uh, Yemeni fabric going forward, Yemeni governance, Yemeni society going forward, Yemeni economics going forward. Um, and then you had the constitutional conference uh, in Abu Dhabi over the summer of 2014, and again. Uh, you know, my understanding is that the outcome was very <coughs> good, and everybody everybody signed on to it. So, so I would say that that the performance of the of the the elements of the GCC initiative itself was pretty positive. The problem that we had was that everything going on outside of the GCC initiative, uh, you had a completely dysfunctional government. Uh, um, Abdurabo Mansour Hadi uh, had his strong points and his weak points. Um, but, uh, you know, you can certainly say that his weak point was that he never understood the politics of his own society. Uh, he was never able to really provide the kind of leadership um, that Yemenis were looking for. I think that we had a golden opportunity in 2011, 2012. February 2012, when we had that election, uh, I think that Hadi genuinely did have the support of the vast majority of Yemeni people. Uh, what happened afterwards is that he was unable to take that, that popular support and translate it into the delivery of, uh, of, of change that the Yemeni people wanted. He was never able to, to do that. Part of it was because of the dysfunctionality of his government. It was because you had this, this kind of hybrid government with the GPC and the JMP both involved. Neither side really committed to um, ensuring the success of the transition, uh, um, never putting their best people into the government, uh, using the government uh, uh, for uh, you know, various corrupt and nefarious purposes. Uh, and then you had other elements, including primarily Ali Abdullah Saleh and the people around him, who were doing everything that they could to undermine the transition and undermine the government. And so we had, as you remember, you know, we went for weeks and weeks and weeks without any power in Sana'a, uh, with, you know, continued attacks in Marib, with, you know, with, with everything that was going on that, that frustrated the Yemeni people and basically sapped all of the positive energy out of this political transition. So when you say, what do you do to change that, uh, I think that the only thing that you can do to change that, and again, to go back to the UN pr uh, process, is if you can get you know, uh, a change in the political dynamics in Sana'a, where you can take those good positive elements that came out of the GCC initiative, and you can get everybody in, in committed, and basically get focused on, on the fact that the GCC initiative, this is a transition. It's not a permanent solution. It was never intended to be a permanent solution. It was only meant to get us from point A, which was the, uh, the political conflict of 2011, to point B, which is to go back to the Yemeni people and give them the opportunity to say again what it is that they wanted and what kind of government they wanted and who they wanted to lead them. 
And that was the only purpose of this. This wasn't a permanent solution. Uh, and, and, you know, to, to get everybody focused on that and everybody to accept um, that, you know, that this is a legitimate transition that they want to see succeed and that they're willing to commit to the outcome of a political process. I think part of the problem that we had is that neither the Houthis nor Ali Abdullah Saleh believed that they were going to win uh, a political fight and therefore they didn't want the political fight to happen and, and that's why they made the move in 2014. Uh, in terms of Ali Abdullah Saleh, my, my own view is I'm sorry that the Saudis missed him uh, on, uh, on those uh, number of occasions that they tried, uh, um, you know, and, and uh, I, I think, and I've said, I've said, uh, you know, uh, in public, I've said uh, to our friends in, in uh, Riyadh and Abu Dhabi that I don't believe that there's any future uh, in uh, Yemen for the Saleh family. Uh, I don't think that we will ever make the transition. And, and one of the things that frustrates me is the, the uh, reports that uh, the Emiratis are talking to, to uh, Ahmed uh, about a role. Uh, I, I think it would be, I think that the worst tragedy that we could have is if at the end of this process, we end up with Ali Abdullah Saleh or Ahmed uh, uh, Ali Saleh back in the presidential palace in, in uh, Sana'a. Because that means that all of the suffering and everything that the Yemeni people have gone through over the six years uh, since the beginning of the Arab Spring would be fundamentally for nothing. We would be right back where we started, and I think that that would be a tragedy. So, so I think that we need to push through, uh, and at the end of the day, uh, Salah needs to be out of the picture. Adwa, we got the question on tribes. Is it waning or wax? Is it? Um, I mean, obviously, the you know, during the war, the tribes have stepped in and they continue to resolve conflicts. They continue to, of course, to varying degrees, they continue to um, um, maintain security in their areas on and on the highways that, you know, pass through their, their territory. Um, but that has also been changing. Um, they've, they've increasingly challenged. Um, and I wouldn't say the tribal structure is breaking down. Um, I mean, obviously, Yemeni tribes have been challenged by the war, and the system has been, you know, kind of eroding. But it's not, uh, it's not to the extent that we see in Afghanistan, for example, where you know, 40 years of war have literally, you know, um, undermined the tribes. Uh, so they're still there. They're still functional. They still have a lot to offer in terms of not just security, but governance and and peace and reconciliation um, at the local level feeding into a national level if possible. Um, but the, continui the continuation of the war is uh, destabilizing the tribes. Um, so just, I mean, on, on, to, follow, to follow up on that, um, on, on first the comment of the, of the president. That's one of the big issue uh, since 2011. We had and have a freelance president someone who doesn't want to do his full-time job. You get Hadi, he's more or less a freelance. Uh, he likes to work sometimes one day a week, one week a year. He doesn't want to take it as a full-time job. And that's one of the biggest issues. Uh, you have an electronic government in Riyadh and a freelance president who isn't really happy with the job uh, he's in, despite how it became tempting. And that's one of the biggest challenges of 2216. If you tomorrow end up with a beast deal that they go back to Sana'a, I bet you most of us in Riyadh don't want to go back. Um, it's too comfortable and it's too nice, and uh, and they don't have that much intention. Um, that's a problem because we do have a legitimate side in Yemen and illegitimate side. That's basics. There is a basic side who did the coup, Saleh and Houthi, and they are illegitimate. And there is a side who, more or less, to a certain degree, was at least a legitimate. Um, now they are both terrible sides. That's the problem. They have. They are both bad sides. They have both saved no chance on harming Yemen and Yemenis in various ways and in various, in various different ways. That's an issue that has reflected on everything, whether in the war, whether in the negotiation, whether on the black market, or whether the overall presence of the country and the overall consequences of the war. In matter of ISIS um, and Qaeda, and I, was, I went to Baida, uh, the same village where the Trump did his first raid, actually. Contrary to Qaeda, ISIS is still a pilot a program in Yemen. 
it is still in the pilot stage. It's still trying to test out how it is going to work. Um, it will face a tremendous challenge compared uh, to Al Qaeda. Uh, <laughs> ISIS first is too violent, and then they face the same problem diplomats usually face in Yemen. They don't speak the local language. Uh, they have a very short-sighted time limit that they want to get this done, while things in Yemen take a long time. And if you think of Al Qaeda like sheikhs, you know they're very close to the society. They spend long time, and think of ISIS like a foreigner, someone who's in a hurry, someone who doesn't speak, someone who's well embraced in the society. That being said, I don't think in the long term they will be a problem as much as Qaeda. Um, Qaeda, in my opinion, remains on Yemen, remains more of a threat and more of a strategic threat than ISIS. On the long term, it's dangerously because of what Nadwa is talking about, they can talk to the tribe uh, and that they can embrace it or the tribe can embrace them or vice versa. Uh, ISIS is too violent for Yemenis. Uh, Yemenis fight, they, they fight, but they're not violent. Uh, it's a very different society. If you look into the long term, the long history of violence we have been, it's, it has been weirdly, even from a political science of, uh, point of view, managed. The tribes fight for 50 years and 10 of them get killed. Mm. Um, that, that, that there is a way, there is an experience with conflict in comes into this country. Um, and that's why I think it doesn't have much a chance uh, compared to it. Um, now, why is it always open? Um, you know, it's, it's a serious a problem. We ask the same question, but this goes back to 3,000 years. You know, we, we, we talked according to the Bible, we talked to Solomon. Um, we actually brought the Persians at one point. Uh, we actually joined Islam by a letter. Um, it's a society and it's a country that's open. Uh, pragmatic, yeah. Pragmatic and adaptive and responsive to the world. We have been Marxist, we have been monarchist, we have been Republicans, and <laughs> we <laughs> have joined the Islam, we, we worship the sun, we were Christians, we were Jews. It's an <laughs> unbelievably dynamic country, and it's open for ideologies, it's open for F-16, it's open for drones, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's open for all of that. That's, that's a plus and a problem, but that's, that's Yemen, a very dynamic country that goes and responds, and, and it takes a lot of, uh, you know, it can exhaust you. Uh, Nasser was there, everyone was there. Um, I don't know much about economy, uh, to be honest, uh, but uh, it is not that promising, for example, uh, from an economic point of view compared to a country like the Gulf or country, uh, like, uh, countries in the Gulf or other places. It's not that, that much of a, of a place. I, I would add something on the economy. Just not well Can I just say just one thing yeah. uh, with regard to Hadi versus Saleh? A friend of mine um, said, this is the problem in Yemen's conflict, the key problem in Yemen's conflict since 2011. We have Saleh, who, 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 who is not convinced that he is no longer a president, and Hadi, who is not convinced that he He's is a president. <laughs> so. That's the truth. That's the truth. Uh, if I can just say a word on the economy, I, uh, it, it's certainly true that on the natural resources side, uh, Yemen isn't, isn't especially rich. Although when I was there, um, uh, we were uh, certainly proposing that the U.S. Geological Survey should come out and do. They had done a study many years ago, um, but it was at a time when the technology wasn't nearly as advanced as it is now, and that uh, we always thought that it would be worthwhile to come out and uh, do another, another look at what mineral resources might be available. Uh, you have the, uh, the Port of Aden, uh, which you know, potentially is an extremely important uh, economic asset, you have geographical location. But what I would say is, uh, you know, the, the idea that we were trying to push um, uh, when, when I was there was, he, you have, uh, I, I agree complete, uh, completely with Faria's, uh, uh, you know, uh, analysis of the Yemeni people. You've got the people. You've got 26 million people um, who work hard, which is not always true of their neighbors. Uh, and uh, and uh, you can um, use Yemen really to establish uh, various kinds of, of production and other things, uh, particularly low-tech, low low-energy uh, requirements, uh, where I think that, that Yemen could be a, uh, a source of production for the entire region. And especially because uh, if, in fact, the GCC follows through on some of the uh, proposals that have been made over these last couple of years, that they would bring Yemen more uh, completely into uh, economic association with, with the GCC. I think that, that you know, Yemen would have a lot to offer in, in terms of, of how the regional economy develops. Got time for one more question, I think. So let's... 
Thank you. Uh, Fuad Shah from the uh, National Center for State Courts. Two, uh, two questions, uh, but they connect. Um, what is the end game, the real, real end game for the Houthis, Ali Abdel Saleh? We know, as the ambassador mentioned, there is no future for him. I highly doubt it. And the Houthis can, are not seen as a, as a group that's going to rule Yemen, rule it in a sense of governance. Um, born Yemen, a southerner, um, and a development practitioner, I cannot see the South returning back to what Yemen was pre-Civil War. Um, I was there during the Civil War that people forgot about mid-1990s. This was a couple years after the unification. There is deep, deep-seated grievances in the South. Um, the idea of power sharing came and went. They felt that they were tricked for, you know, simply put. The idea of a united Yemen is very hard to really fathom with the conflict time and time again, the Southern Sea as we don't want this anymore. So my question is, one, what is the end game of the Houthis? Do they want an autonomous region up north and they're happy with that? Do they want to be a 50-50 power brokers of the north? Ali Abdel Saleh, is it, you know, what is he still trying to get from all of this, his family? But again, w what is Yemen after this war? Uh, will it be a, 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 like Iraq, you have the Kurds, you have the uh, Shia Sunni, or will it just be back to something we don't even know? I mean, or they don't, the Yemenis don't know. So uh, my question is the northern part and the southerners and what is their future, let alone the future of Yemen as a governing, united government? Thank you. Um, I mean, we can't finish that today. It's, it's <laughs> what does, I mean, what does, um, one thing with Saleh specifically, you, he thought in 2011 he can uh, 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 pull out the Putin Medvedev thing. Um, he can bring someone for two years and then come back from the window. Um, and that's one reason why he actually, and he had a deal with Hadi about that, by the way. Um, and that's why he was later frustrated, is he thought he can play this and, and, and for, a, uh, uh, for a lack, uh, absence of a better term, he thought that the revolution was a fake news something everyone is plotting against him, and he will just deal with it like he does with the crisis and comes back. So that's why he became very destructive after that. Um, he wants uh, three things today. That's his end game, I think, in Yemen, my end game. He wants immunity to continue, which is a bit tricky. He wants his money from sanctions. This is more, than, more important to him than Saleh. He wants the sanctions to be removed, especially his financial ones. Um, and that's a pretty tricky another condition. You probably can play with it with a, via the Iran model, which is you behave, we remove some things in two years, blah, blah. You just you make sure that this is not a new license for him again to do whatever he wants. And he wants his son a president of the party. Um, that's his third thing. And he will have to step for that. I mean, that's, he's the one blocking his son from that, that thing. Um, but it's, these are, I think, his end game, ultimately. The Houthis are still trying to figure it. Uh, they, at one point, thought that they can run Yemen. Uh, they, they were surprised. They were surprised themselves. They took the capital and they're like, oh, so we can go to Aden. Oh, uh, you know, so we can go into, ah, oh, okay. So there was something for them actually. Um, and after that, they have been just uh, in a mood of fighting. Not, I don't think they have had the chance to reflect because as soon as they started uh, thinking, they fought with Saleh. Oh, we actually have a problem here. Someone is sharing with us. Uh, someone is going to compete with us. That's, that's I think, the most important thing um, into, into thinking about it. Um, I leave the South to the guys. But one final important uh, point I want to make is, uh, and this is the way that everyone is addressing Yemen's conflict, and it's a problem, whether we speak of the Saudis or we speak of the Americans. In Saudi, I was also there in, in June. Um, every single thing has to do with Yemen is in the hand of the intelligence. There is no diplomats working on it. There is no, no politicians doing with it. It's in the hand of officers in the intelligence committee who have no experience in politics and who have a very Similar to America's narrative toward Yemen, they have a lot of data, but they don't have information, and there is a quite a big difference. And they are not able to capture Yemen. This is a war, but you fight it with diplomacy more than with F-16s, and they have completely failed in that. Even the aid, when it goes to Yemen, is actually a military intelligence decided cipher. Even the ones who deliver the aid is actually from the intelligence, and that have made Saudi 
very much unable to understand Yemen. Since Prince Sultan died and since the princes were left out of this politics and it was handed to officers, they never really got Yemen right. And that will be one of the biggest challenges to move forward on, 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 on that. My very final point is about the Gulf, about the, the uh, joining the GCC, if it remains, hopefully. Um, is this has been one of the biggest problems with the Gulf. They have been complaining for the last three years that Yemen has fallen into the hand of Iran. But they have shut down their door in front of Yemen and Yemenis for the last 30 years from joining the GCC. If you are unhappy with Iran taking over, then you need to open your door. You cannot basically uh, uh, you know, disattach Yemen, disattach geography, and then complain that it is falling into the hand of other power. That's a serious issue. But there is a tendency within the Gulf, for some reason, and I don't think it's a purpose, but it's just an attitude, there is a tendency to punish Yemenis for what their leaders do. Think of 1990, when Saleh sided with Saddam. Mm -hmm. What happens? Instead of pushing Saleh out of power, they kicked out 800,000 Yemenis from the Gulf labor. And that is one of the main reasons why Yemen is in the mess it is today, actually. It was the most expensive no in the history of the country. Yeah? Um, the vote he did inside the UN Security Council. But again, the way to approach it was the same way that they have done with this war, is deal with it the wrong way and actually um, not, 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 not deal with the problem as it emerged um, in the past. Um, yeah. So with regard to unification, um, you know, I share what Farah said. Farah has talked about three different Yemens that he saw when he, when he was in Yemen. And I think there is even more than that. Um, I was in Aden last October, and I saw a de facto secession. The South is already seceded in effect. Um, having said that, um, there is a lot of disparities in the South. And right now, there is power struggle between the Emiratis and Hadi. And Hadi, even though he's not very popular, he still has a lot of supporters in Abiyan and in, in the South. Um, and I think there could potentially be uh, in the future, potential power struggle between the Emiratis and the Saudis in the South as well. Um, and that's true to other areas like, like Taiz and maybe other areas and as well. So Yemen unity, I think, you know, sadly, I, I, I think it's highly unlikely that we will see one Yemen the way it used to be. Yeah, I, I would just say, uh, um, you know, I, I agree that, that you won't see Yemen as it used to be. That's probably not a bad thing. Um, the the, the uh, National Dialogue Conference did come out with a recommendation on decentralization and, and trying to push uh, decision making down to a more local um, uh, level. Um, they did uh, embrace the idea of federalism. Uh, I think that it was mismanaged. Yes, um, absolutely. You know, it was, it was <coughs> mismanaged, but I think that the idea that, that Yemen um, should be a federal state is, is actually probably the right answer for the country. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I believe that, that unity for Yemen is uh, absolutely an essential element, not only for, for Yemen, but for the region and the world, because, uh, because I, I think that the reality is that, that um, uh, a divided Yemen means that you'll have um, failed states. Yes. And, and no reason to think that Yemen, if it were divided, would only divide into two pieces. Uh, I think it would divide at least into three and maybe even more than three pieces, and uh, all of which would be susceptible to violent extremism, uh, all of which would lack economic uh, uh, capacity to support their people, and it would just become a, a, an enduring problem in the region. So. So I think that we, you know, uh, should continue to push for a unified Yemen, but with changes in the structure that address the legitimate concerns of the people in the South as well as elsewhere. And that's one main difference between UAE and Saudi. Saudi realizes that or have the, the, the belief that Yemen must be one, or remain one. And because it has a different narrative toward Yemen, because it shares the borders. It doesn't want to deal more with more than one headache. It just wants one more is more than enough already. That's a different from UAE, where it doesn't have a border, and it's a quite adventurous, and it wants to do some to try test out some things, um, including the vision of how many Yemens there should be. I do agree that federalism or something around it has to be the idea ultimately, but it has to be thought of 
the last division of labor or of, of region which actually sparked this war was happened in one week yeah. if you have to divide this room it will take you more than one room to design it uh, but that that wasn't the, that wasn't the, probably the most thoughtful thing into it but it will have to be within that element i agree ultimately Okay, on that note, we've gone over our time limit. I want to thank all of you for thank a very you. rich uh, set of, of presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.